Good evening, church. Welcome. We hope that you will spend this time, come closer to the Lord, get a little um, more familiar with the people around you. So join us. Go ahead and stand and join with us as we sing, okay? other. We're so glad you're here. way back to the seat and get ready to sing with us. Okay. 
thankful that we serve a worthy God and that we're able to come here and just show him a little bit of our gratitude for all he's done for us.
Hey, just remain standing for a moment, if you will. We're going we're gonna to take some time and pray tonight. And uh, what a privilege to be in church. Amen? What an honor to be here. And so we're going to do what we have done the past several weeks. And I'm going to ask everyone to get into groups of three. And men, pray with men. Women, pray with women. And uh, let me, before you go, share a couple of things that I want us to pray specifically for tonight. Brother Bill Britt uh, messaged me a little earlier before church, asked us to pray for him. And uh, those of you that know him and have heard him preach here know that he has an extensive ministry in Kenya and in India. And uh, with more restrictions and requirements that are being put on them with medical needs and other needs. And um, a van that is needed in their Bible college. Other things that are being required from the government in the orphanages. It's just putting a strain on them. And here was his words to me. Uh, Brother Jerry, this is not an appeal for money. This is an appeal for prayer. And who knows that God knows the need. Amen. So I just want us tonight to pray for him and to pray for their ministry and for their work in Africa and in India. And just pray God would meet the need. Our God is a God that knows the need and he'll meet the need. So that's number one. Number, number two, uh, I want to selfishly ask you to pray for your pastor, to pray for me. And to pray that, uh, you know, people ask me all of the time, uh, what can I pray for you about? And I mean, immediately, the number one thing I always ask you to pray for is wisdom from the Lord. There just simply is never a day, never an hour, never a week, never a time where I do not need the Lord's mind, the Lord's heart and wisdom. And, and I never, ever want to be a hindrance of what the Lord wants to do in this church. And so pray for your pastor to have wisdom from heaven and to stay close to him and clean and listen to him. Amen? Uh, thirdly, I want to ask us to specifically pray tonight for our Bible conference. And if you've been living under a rock the past couple of weeks and you've not heard, uh, we're going to have our Bible conference this year in September, the 24th through the 27th. And we are now 67 days away. 67 days away. And it's going to be good. Uh, Jonathan Falwell will be with us from Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, Bill Britt, Herb Revis, many others. We'll share more about all of that. And, you know, the good thing about it is it doesn't matter if you come morning, night, when you come. Uh, every year we have people that say, Preacher, you know, tell me who's preaching when. And, and I get it and I understand it, but I'm just going <laughs> to do a preemptive strike don't ask that because it doesn't matter when you come I believe God's gonna be speaking amen and uh, but you watch it won't stop uh, wanting to know who's preaching when but it's gonna be good amen it's gonna really really be good and so you you pray for this time together that we'd meet with God amen 67 days are you ready I mean ready or not right here it comes Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, 9.30, Monday night, 6.30, Tuesday and Wednesday, same schedule. And we're just looking forward to what the Lord's going to do. Preacher, is this a conference for pastors? This is a conference for our church. But we invite pastors to come and get in on it. This is for everyone. Uh, this is for 12-year-olds. This is for 92-year-olds. This is for everyone. And the one common denominator is going to be the presence of the Lord, worship in the Lord, and the Word of God. And if you really want to think about it, you'd have to go to church a lot of Sundays to get what you're going to get in these few days. And it's going to be good. Uh, you know what I notice when we take kids to camp? You get away from the noise. You get away from distractions. You get away from interruptions. You get away from, from these. And uh, God speaks to you. And often I have adults say, man, we need camp. Well, September 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th. And you don't even have to sleep in a bunk bed. Amen? <laughs> and so uh, mark it on your calendar. Circle it on your calendar. Change your plans. Rearrange your schedule. This is for you. This is for every single solitary person in our church. And I'm asking the Lord to fill this building completely full. Uh, there are going to be a few surprises. Uh, tell us, no, they're surprises. And we'll sneak them in as we get a little closer, okay? But September 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, mark those dates, pray over those dates, pray God show up in this place. Amen? Uh, 
hey, we're going to pray in a minute, but let me just whet your appetite a little more, okay? We're going to ask families, uh, not tonight, but we're going to ask families in our church to volunteer. And when pastors come, you're going to adopt them. And it'll be your job that week to just love on them, pray for them, minister to them, whatever it'll be. If, if God would use this time for our church to revive our church, but to use us to just inspire, hey, what if we could fan the flame in 100 pastors' hearts and it impact their congregations? Do you believe God could use this church to do that, yes or no? Do you believe that he could? You know, there's a lot of conferences around the country to learn creativity and breakout sessions, and I'm not knocking any of that, I'm not. But what's on my heart is one where we get with God we meet with God, we preach the word, and we just have revival from heaven. So that's our heart. You pray, you be ready to step up to the plate, do whatever it takes, make sure you're here. And what I want you to do is in your circle of influence over the next 67 days, uh, everyone in church, uh, you know, talk to them, guilt them, shame them, manipulate them, whatever you gotta do to make sure 100% of our church is here for this. It's going to be good. So tonight, here's the prayer points. Just got to get us ready. Pray for your pastor for wisdom from heaven. And right now there's just, and, and this is every week in the life of a pastor, but right now this week, and it's nothing bad, it's all good, but right now there's, I don't know, five or six specific things that I just need the Lord to give me direction on. And uh, it's good stuff, but pray for me to listen and to stay close to him. Uh, secondly, pray for Bill Britt. Pray for Compel Outreach International. Pray for their needs. Thirdly, pray for our church. Pray for God's glory to fall on us. Then fourth, for our Bible conference. Can we all do that? So let's break up in our groups. Let's just go to pray, and we're going to take a few moments. And when we're done, I'll come close us in prayer. We'll keep singing, and then we'll have a word tonight. So get with a group, about three in a group. Ladies, if you'll get with a group of ladies, men, and in a moment, I'll come and I'll close us out. Four specific things. Pray for our church, for our conference. Pray for Bill Britt. Pray for wisdom for your pastor. Let's pray for those four things right now.
Father, tonight in the name of Jesus, we join our hearts together in agreement with each other and with you. Will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we come to you tonight to submit to you and to say thank you for your faithfulness and thank you for your goodness and thank you for your grace. Lord, we together lift these needs before you for our brother, Brother Bill. You're a God that is on his throne. You're a God that supplies every need. And I'm asking you in the name of Jesus, supernaturally, that you would provide the need. Move in his life, move in that ministry, move in their school and orphanage in Africa and in India and provide for your glory. God, we ask you for divine wisdom and direction that you'll lead our church, that we'll stay close to you as a body of believers, and that, Father, we'll do all that we can just to stay in touch with you and in tune with you and in step with you and will never stray to the right or to the left or do anything that hinders the work that you desire to do. God, we lift up our Bible conference and we just thank you, Lord, for what you want to do. I lift up every single person who will be preaching, who will be singing, who will be leading. I pray your anointing would be on them, that you would use them and prepare them and give them a word from heaven that we need. I pray that you'd give to each one of us ears to hear what you want to say. God, I pray that you'd put a heavy burden on each and every individual that is a part of this church to be here each and every service, that you'll make it easy, that you'll prepare the way, that you'll remove distractions, that you'll remove hindrances, and that from the north, south, east, and west, you will draw people to yourself. And Lord, our heart's desire is that you would bring pastors from all around this country that you would give to us a ministry and an influence to pour into pastors, to encourage them, to love them, to help them, to let them know there are people who want to stand in the gap for them and pray for them. And Lord, we're living in the last days and we need you. And we want to be a place that you will use, that you will raise up to speak life to people and to minister the truth. And so Father, do what only you can do those days. We just pray, Father, that as we get beyond that and look back we will know that our lives have forever been changed having been with you those days lord continue to move tonight continue to speak to our heart continue to have your way in our lives we love you and we honor you and we thank you for all that you're going to do in jesus name amen say amen. You can be seated, church. Thank you guys for leading us. We really, really appreciate it. And if you'll take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I would appreciate it. And uh, we're going to spend a few moments in the Word tonight. And uh, we are 
excited about all the Lord is doing. The summer is passing us by, and soon it will be over, and uh, we'll move on to the fall. So let me mention a couple of things while you're turning. Next Wednesday is our last Life Group Fellowship for the summer. And, uh, you know, some may say, Preacher, why in the world are we doing that? Because fellowship's a part of, <laughs> fellowship is, is a part of it. Amen? And I, I am convinced as a pastor that we don't do it enough. And so it is a great opportunity for you to get in your small group. And we've been hearing some wonderful stories of different groups. And I don't mean this ugly. If your group's not planning anything, uh, ask your teacher why. Ask them why they're not. Ask them what's going on. I don't mean be rude. I don't mean be mean. I'm just saying get with the program. Amen. I mean, we've got groups that have been going to eat, going to the park, going different outings. And so, you know, don't, don't be lazy. I mean, get with it. Fellowship. Get together. Do something. It's good stuff. And so this is your last opportunity uh, this next coming Wednesday, and we're looking forward to that. And then we'll be moving into August. Don't forget, we talked about it Sunday, our fifth Sunday offering, July 30th. Uh, make that a matter of prayer. That's coming up right around the corner, and uh, we know the Lord's going to continue to bless in that. First Thessalonians 5, and uh, I want to read in verse 16. First Thessalonians 5. And verse number 16, listen to what it says, rejoice evermore. Now, I want you to notice these statements. I mean, here the apostle Paul is writing to the church, and I mean, he just, these are just, uh, I mean, it's the words of a preacher. It's from the heart of a preacher. And I mean, when you, when you look at them, they're, they're unconnected sentences, and he's all over the map. I mean, rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. I mean, these are some directives. These are some mandates. These are some commands. In everything, give thanks. So, I mean, just, just look at this. Rejoice, pray. I mean, you preacher, what am I supposed to do? What's the life of a believer? Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. We'll talk about that in a minute. I mean, what, what does that mean, pray without ceasing? I mean, there's 24 hours in a day. And so, you know, I don't know about you. I like to sleep at least a few hours. Amen. And I like to eat. I highly recommend that. Yes or no? And so, you know, what does this mean, pray without ceasing? I mean, how am I to do that? I mean, 24 hours in a day, I, I want to sleep a little bit. And so what is the Lord talking about? We'll see that in just a moment. So rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. You and I would understand that better if he would have said, in most things give thanks. But it's when he says, in everything give thanks. Now, who in the room has gone through some stuff and you just don't feel like giving thanks? Okay. Yeah. Y'all are slow, slow, slow coming around tonight. Y'all okay out there, amen? In everything, everything give thanks. Why? This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning for you. Do you know how many books have been written on the will of God, discerning the will of God, knowing the will of God? How can I know the will of God? Preacher, I'd just give anything if I knew the will of God. This is the will of God right here, that in everything you give thanks. You don't have to pray about that. That is the will of God. You are right on. You are right in the middle of the will of God. If in everything you've given, let me tell you what's not the will of God to murmur, to complain. To make your preacher have to beg you say amen. That's another thing. So, in everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Two commands as it relates to the Holy Spirit in this regard uh, quench not the Spirit, grieve not the Holy Spirit. When the Bible talks about grieving the Holy Spirit, you cannot grieve an it. No matter how hard I try, I'll never grieve this desk right here. The Holy Spirit is not an it. He is a person, mind, emotions, and will. The Bible talks about the mind of the Spirit, the intellect of the Spirit, the emotions. Do you know the Holy Spirit has emotions? The Bible says don't grieve him. Do you know you can grieve him? And then he has a will. It talks about the will of the Spirit that searches the deep things of God. And so in that instance, he says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Here he says do not quench the Holy Spirit. Did you know that was a command? Do you know that's a directive? That's a mandate for you and me. Despise not prophesying. In, in other words, don't turn a deaf ear. Don't stiff arm uh, the truth. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. So put things to the test, but when you get something that's true, cling to it. Man, when God gives you something that's the real deal, hold fast to that. Hang on to it. Let me just tell you something. I'm thankful for what God does in our church. I'm thankful to be a part of Mims Baptist Church. I have no desire to be a part of any other church. And I'm not saying that to be ugly or disrespectful or to in any way look down my nose at any other church. I'm just telling you, this is where home is for my heart. Amen? 
And I just believe you ought to believe in your team and put your money where your mouth is, but that's another sermon. (laughs) So prove all things, but hold fast to that which is good. And I don't know about you, but I want to cling to that which is good. I want to hold fast to that which is good. I don't want to let go of that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, body, be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all of the brethren with a holy kiss. Now, there you go. Well, let's preach on that tonight. If you don't mind, men, I'm going to stick with a holy handshake. Can I get a witness? Amen? (laughs) Let's pray. Father, speak your word to our heart. Uh, We love you. We honor you. We're so thankful to be here tonight and to be in your presence. Uh, Just do what only you can do, and we'll thank you for it. In the name of Jesus that I pray, and everyone said amen. Amen. You know, we we do a lot of talking about revival. Uh, In our church, we talk about it a lot. It's a word that we use a lot. Sometimes there's a misunderstanding of the difference between, for example, an awakening and a revival. Sometimes, admittedly, there is a misunderstanding in our culture between evangelism and revival. Uh, I've been a part of crusades. I have preached through the years several crusades in football stadiums, and we've seen many people saved, but that's not revival. That's evangelism. And who understands we need evangelism? But don't confuse evangelism with revival. And yes, we need an awakening. Our nation needs an awakening. Uh, Our nation, those that are lost, need to be awakened to the reality of who God is. And God has the ability to move on their heart. And God has the ability to bring conviction, deep conviction of sin, and the realization that I need a Savior. And only God can do that. And all of our church marquees and all of our church logos and all of the things that we can do, as important, important as they are, none of that will facilitate an awakening. God has to do it. But when we talk about revival, we're talking about the household of faith. We're talking about believers. We're talking about those in the room who know the Lord Jesus Christ. The joke is you cannot have revival until you have been vived. Uh, and so, therefore, we that are saved by the grace of God, are the candidates for revival. Here in these verses, the Apostle Paul is closing out a letter to the church of Thessalonica, and he is dealing with several issues that are in rapid-fire order. These are mandates. These are directives. These are not suggestions. And it would seem, it would appear at first glance, that they're all over the map. It's as if the Apostle Paul is concluding his letter, and as a typical preacher will do, he'll say, finally, and yet he just keeps going. And so he's continuing to address some important issues in your life and my life and in the life of these believers at this church. Paul commends this church and he says to this church that your faith is being talked about literally all around the world. Uh, Paul would open the letter to them and he would say, what's going on in your church is being noised abroad, it's being talked about. I've heard people say the worst thing that people can say about your church is nothing. And that's true. And I'm telling you, uh, you know, advertisement I'm not suggesting that it's wrong for a church to do those things or for us to ever do those things. But I'm telling you, the greatest advertisement is for it to be noised abroad and for everyone in our community to hear Jesus is in the house. Because there is no greater, yes or no, no greater joy than knowing that Jesus is here. There's no other compliment. You cannot top that. That is a mic drop moment. To know that Jesus is here, to know that he's changing lives, to know that the word of God is being treasured and being preached, and may that always be said about us. And Paul would say to these believers that your faith is being talked about all around the world, the known world, it had spread literally all around, and and it's being noised abroad of what's going on in your church. And so then he closes it out, and I've sort of grouped these directives, these mandates into a couple of different categories. And what I want to talk about for a few moments are basically the evidence is that I'm walking in revival, that you're walking in revival, that we're walking in revival. And rather than looking at it corporately, let's look at it individually in your life and my life and all of our life as believers. And we're going to begin with some personal principles, some personal signs that the Apostle Paul would give to you and to me to know whether or not we're walking before the Lord in real, real revival. And so let's point them out. The first personal sign, the first personal evidence, the first personal principle that he would give to us in verses 16 through 18 is, watch this, when I'm walking before the Lord in real revival, there will be joy. 
Now, now who in the room is thankful for the joy of the Lord tonight? Uh, and who in the room would agree that there's not a whole lot of joy in this world? Uh, I, I said it Sunday, I'll say it again, you know, one of the funniest church signs that I've ever been able to see. Uh, I used to, you know, years ago stop and take pictures of church signs and someone bought me a church sign book and I mean, there's just some crazy uh, things that have been put out there on church signs. My all-time favorite is, you know, uh, CH and, and the words are missing. Guess who's missing in church? You are. And, 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 you know, they're knocking the doors down to get in because of that, right? But one of my all-time favorite church signs, it said, don't let the world kill you, let us help. And, you know, I, every time I tell that, you laugh like you've never heard it before. <laughs> and, and so, you know, there's not a whole lot of joy. And I have to confess to you during my 11 years of traveling the country to preach in churches every single week. Sometimes there were four and five churches in one week, and I lost count. I'm, I'm probably, uh, it was probably upward of seven, 750 churches. I don't know how many that I had the privilege of going to preach to. And I mean, that's an honor, ladies and gentlemen, for someone to call you and say, we want you to come preach. But I can't tell you how many times, I'm the guest, I'm the preacher. I can't tell you how many times I would walk in and no one would say a word. And it, they would look at you sort of like stranger danger. Who knows what I'm talking about? And, and, you know, who are you? You're not from around here, are you? And, you know, you ask yourself, why don't people go to church? And the sad truth and the sad reality is they've already been. And that's why a lot of people are not going to church, because they've already been. And so we live in a world where there's so much depression, and we live in a world where there's so much despondency and discouragement, right? And there's so much to complain about. And so many people are down, and so many people are looking for answers and hope. I remember W.A. Criswell saying many years ago, he was the esteemed pastor at First Dallas for, what, 50 years, and I remember him back in the 90s preaching, and he said years ago he was at a church and he was preaching a revival, and he said it was as dead as it could be. No one said anything. No one smiled. No one came to the altar. No one said amen, and he said afterwards he went with a group of people to a restaurant, and he said and the people that were taking care of him, man, they were joyful, and they were smiling, and they were singing, and they were laughing, and everyone was high-fiving, and everyone was talking. And he said he thought to himself, my gracious, if both of those places, the church and the restaurant, had given an invitation that night, I would have joined the restaurant. <laughs> Amen? And so, you know, when you think about this, we, we announce to the world the joy of the Lord is our strength, and yet so few have joy. So few ever, ever smile. So few ever, ever rejoice. So few ever, ever, ever can work through their issues. And so the Lord begins by saying from the Apostle Paul to these believers, verse 16, it's simple, rejoice evermore. Now what is one of the signs and one of the evidences and one of the personal principles in my own heart that I'm walking before God in real revival? That is, there will be joy in my heart. There will be rejoicing and it'll be evermore. It'll be continual. Preacher, are there days you don't feel like rejoicing? Absolutely. And I confess to you there are moments where I am rejoicing and boom, the next moment I'm not. Who can testify that's true? And I have to have an attitude check sometimes a hundred or more times a day. Don't nod your head, please, sweet lady, and they say amen. I have to have an attitude check many times throughout the day, yes or no. And the Lord here says rejoice evermore. Why is it that we as Christians sometimes are the most difficult to get along with? Why is it sometimes that we as believers are so often so hard and so calloused? Sometimes it's because the hand of God is against us. Sometimes it's because there's conviction. There is a spiritual element to a church that you don't deal with. And I, I need, you know, please don't push back, just listen. There is a spiritual element, I mean, as a pastor, to try to keep all of us together and to try to keep all of us moving in the right direction and not getting sidetracked over here with the least little things and squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. It, it, it's, it's a constant, it's a constant to always keep before us always the need to get our focus on the Lord, get our focus on the Lord, get our, do you want to know why? Because there is a spiritual degree and a spiritual element that is at work in the household of faith that's not at work necessarily down at this factory or that job or this particular place. I'm not saying there's not spiritual elements there. I'm just saying, uh, folks, listen to me. There's a business can shut down. It's not going to destroy necessarily a lot of things. But if the devil can destroy a church, he can get a lot of mileage out of it. And so the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. Now, what does that mean? That means why do we struggle sometimes? 
Do you ever have a struggle with looking at someone and maybe you don't think they looked at you the way you thought they should look at you and the devil puts all kind of thoughts in your mind? Who would agree that? Come on, get honest. Now, you may or may not experience that at work or at school, but in church, oh my, they didn't open the door for me. They didn't shake my hand. They talked to that person, but not me. The preacher didn't look at me. That deacon didn't look at me. That person didn't smile. And the enemy lies. Why? Because the devil wants to turn all of us against each other. Why? So we can kill each other and destroy each other. Why? So he can hinder the work of the Lord. Why? So that people die and go to hell. And we've got to always be wise and aware of what the enemy wants to do and not be ignorant of his devices. And I don't know about you. There's many times I've got to get in my prayer closet and get my attitude fixed. Because the devil will lie to me. You know, what's wrong with that person? Why is that person this way? Why? And I'm just going to tell you, it's hard to be mad at someone you're praying for. It's hard to hate someone you're praying for. Amen? And I'm just telling you, listen, one of the things and one of the elements that's missing so much in our lives is the joy of the Lord. Now, let's talk about this joy for a minute. When he says rejoice evermore, he's not talking about happiness. As a matter of fact, if you go back and read to these people, they were going through some difficulties. One of the most beautiful things about the New Testament is the Lord is writing to people. They're going through tough stuff. They're going through difficult stuff. And the Lord is writing to them and he's saying, in every circumstance, in every situation, rejoice, have joy. Why? In spite of your circumstances, not because of them. Do we pray for God to change our circumstances? Yes, we do. Do we pray to a God who can change our circumstances? Yes, we do. Does he often do it? Yes. But are there times he does not? There are. And what then? We surrender to him and he gives us joy in the midst of circumstances. Amen? What is my rejoicing in? Rejoicing in the Lord is what the Bible says, as Paul would say it in Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice is what he said. Where does my joy come from? It comes from in the Lord. How are you doing today? Pretty good under the circumstances. Have you ever heard that answer? Silly analogy, but y'all seem to like them. That'd be like you asking me, how'd you sleep last night? Pretty good under the mattress. <laughs> Amen? You don't sleep under it, you sleep on it. How are you doing? Pretty good under the circumstances. What do you mean under the circumstances? I'm telling you, despite your circumstances, you can still have joy. You say, Satan took my joy. He cannot take your joy. You have to willingly forfeit it. Well, I'd have joy if it weren't for my wife or weren't for my husband or weren't for my kids or weren't. No, ma'am, no, sir. No one can steal your joy. The book on joy is the book of Philippians. It's mentioned 19 times. And Paul wrote the book from prison. And yet the whole theme of the book was joy. So if he in prison in a dark, lonely, damp dungeon chained to guards, the praetorium guard, day in and day out, could talk about joy and have joy, you can have joy, I can have joy. And it comes from in the Lord. Not from our circumstances. It's not, well, if I get a raise, I'll have joy. If I get a better job, I'll have joy. If my kids do right, I'll have joy. No, it's I can have joy in spite of circumstances because the joy of the Lord is my strength. I've got the, should I say it? I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. There you go, buddy. Down in my heart to stay, right? Amen? Boy, you know your songs around here. Joy in Jesus. Rejoice evermore. One of the first evidences of real revival in my heart, personal evidences, is the joy of the Lord. Let me tell you one more thing about joy. We'll move on. Did you know joy is a fruit of the Spirit? The Bible calls it love, joy. It's the second one mentioned. And when the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit, it does not say fruits, plural of the Spirit. It says fruit, singular. There's nine mentioned, and it doesn't mean, well, I'll take love, but I don't want patience. It means one of the evidences you're walking in the Spirit is you have them all. Preacher, why don't I have joy? Do you really want the answer? Y'all want to wait, or do you want it right now? Preacher, why don't I have any joy? Because you're walking in the flesh. Anytime that I'm a grouch, mean, ugly, no joy, upset, short fuse. There's one simple answer. It's because it's Jerry and not Jesus. We cannot say it enough. All of the bad that comes from me is me. And any good you ever see is him. And the joy is a fruit of the Spirit. And the only way to have joy is walk in the Spirit. And if there's no joy, it's because you're controlling your life, I'm controlling my life, 
and you're dominated by the flesh and not the spirit. Just yield to the Lord and surrender, and the evidence of him living his life through you is there'll be joy. Amen? Well, let me give you the second personal principle, and that is there's prayer. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Well, I mentioned in a moment ago, as I read, how do I pray without ceasing? 24 hours in a day, we've laughed at this, but it's true. I like to sleep a few hours. I like to eat. Um, I mean, I'm not praying right now. I'm preaching. And, And so what does that mean? You know, pray without ceasing. What's that talking about? Well, when you study that phrase without ceasing, it's really an interesting word. Have you ever had a nagging cough? And, and watch this. You just can't, you can't knock it. And it may not mean that you always cough, but what it means, the urge to cough is always there. That's what that word without ceasing means. And what it means is this. It's not saying that 24 hours a day, all that you ever do is pray. But what it means is the desire to pray and the urge to pray is always there. And here's what it means. If I get a phone call from someone in our church that says, preacher, I need you to pray now. You don't need me to have to spend an hour to repent in order to get through. You need me to be able to now pray. And we need friends and family in our life. Yes or no? Hey, listen, when an emergency happens, it's, it's not time to have to crawl into the lap of the Lord and say, well, Lord, I haven't talked to you in two weeks, and I want you to know I need to confess this and this and this and this and this. Keep a, keep a short sin list. Stay current. That means, listen, you've got to deal with stuff all of the time. I, I, I don't think this is ever more important than in the life of parents. Because when our kids call on us and need us to pray for them, they need us to be able to get through now. Amen. So pray without ceasing. What does that mean? Does it mean you're 24 hours a day praying? No, what it means is the urge to pray, the desire to pray is always there and you're ready at a moment's notice to pray. Amen? Have you ever asked someone to pray before you eat and it's been very obvious they're way behind on their prayer time? Amen? Don't ever ask anyone that just got through eating to pray for the meal because they'll just pray, pray, pray. They'll pray for foreign missions. They'll pray for... Aunt Sookie, they'll pray for the weather. They'll pray. Yes or no? Amen? <laughs> Sorry. Pray without ceasing. Always be ready to pray. That's one of the evidences. I notice in my own life, I notice in my own heart, watch this, watch this, when the urgency to not pray is, is missing, there, there's something missing in my life. It's me. It's, it's my fault. But I'm, I'm just telling you, watch this. When you're walking before the Lord in a spirit of revival, there's the desire to pray. And it's always there, and you're ready. And you know what else? There's answers. And you know what else? He leads you. And you know what else? He directs you. And you know what else? I mean, he teaches. Look, just this past week, just this past week, I was at camp, and, and I needed a word from the Lord on one specific thing. And I prayed Sunday nothing. I prayed Monday, nothing. I prayed Tuesday, nothing. Who's ever done this before? I prayed Wednesday, nothing. And I was so frustrated. And I was more frustrated with me than the Lord, but there was nothing. And so as I prayed Wednesday, the Lord redirected me and showed me to pray for something else and pray in another way. And I had never thought of it. And so I said, okay, Lord, I'm asking you now for permission for this. And I'm telling you, the next morning, boom, the Lord gave me exactly what I needed. I'm just telling you, when you let the Holy Spirit lead you in prayer and you're praying without ceasing, he'll give you a yes, he'll give you a no, he'll give you a wait, he'll redirect you, he'll give you something different, he'll show you what else, he'll lead you and he'll guide you. Do you know the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord? Does anyone in the room understand that? Do you know as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God? Hey, look, who's still awake? Say amen. As many as are led by the Spirit, they're the sons of God. Two Greek words for son, weos technon. One of them means you're begotten of the Father. That means you're born again. The other one means you look like your daddy. If Keely ever hears anything, especially from you folks, it's you look just like your daddy. Someone asked her the other day, has anyone ever told you you look like your daddy? And she said, no, I've never heard that before. She acts like her daddy too, yes or no. So, As many as are led by the Spirit, they're the sons of God. Guess which word that is? That means you resemble your daddy. 
You start looking like your heavenly father when you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, when you allow the Holy Spirit to direct you and to guide you. Amen? We don't need to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. We need to be spirit-led people. And so another evidence is there's prayer. Let's move on. Thirdly, Thanksgiving, verse 18. These are personal principles. In everything, give thanks because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It is, oh my goodness, we need to shout this out loud. It is the will of God for you to give thanks in everything. It is never the will of God for grumbling, moaning, griping, complaining, and everyone in the house said, oh me. I got you on that. Oh me. Thanksgiving. One of the evidences that I'm walking in personal revival, watch this, is there'll be joy, there'll be prayer, there'll be thanksgiving. And I'll give thanks in everything. Someone has said it correctly, only one kind of person can be thankful for everything, and that's an humble person. And the reason for that is I recognize if God never, ever gives me a single thing, I have more than I deserve. Amen? My sister was dying of pancreatic cancer, and I've told this before. People would come in her room from our hometown, and they meant well. They, 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 they weren't there to hurt her, but they would come to pray for her, and they would say to her, they would say to her I mean, she's, she's dying. And they would say to her, uh, if you had enough faith, uh, God would heal you. And um, she just smiled. She never argued. She didn't have the energy to argue. And so one day I went to check on her, and it was just the two of us. And here's what she said. She said, Jerry, I don't doubt they're right, but I'll tell you, it takes a lot of faith to say, I know God can heal me, but if he chooses not to, I'll still serve him. Amen? So you, you say, well, it takes a lot of faith. No, it takes a lot of faith to say, God, you're God. If you never answer one of my prayers, you're still God, and you're still good. Where was God when this happened in my life? The same place where he was when his son was on a cross for you and me. I want you to know he's a good God. Amen? And we don't worship him, we don't praise him, we don't honor him because he gives us good gifts or answers prayer or does good things. Matter of fact, this may be the boldest thing I've ever said. I don't know, but I heard this years ago. It's so true. Do you know if God said to you and to me, I'm sending you to hell, don't you ever bother asking me to save you because I will not save you? Do you know while on our way to hell, he would still be worthy of our praise? Because we don't praise him for what he's done. We praise him for who he is. And if that's true, and I'm telling you, it is, how much more should we praise him for what he's done for us? Amen? Because he's forgiven us so much. And so one of the personal signs is, in everything, give thanks. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Lord, forgive me for grumbling. I'm going to need someone to come counsel me here in a minute. <laughs> talking about joy. Amen? Talking about prayer. Talking about Thanksgiving. I need you to pray for me. I don't want to complain. Lord, thank you. Has he been good to anyone in this room? Has, has he been faithful to anyone in this room? He's so good. And in everything. And, and we all need attitude adjustments. We all need reminders throughout the day. We get off track so often. Paul said, I die daily. We've got to continually die to ourselves. So those are some of the pup, uh, personal evidences. Let me give you the second and final thing. Quickly, verse 19. And the next group is there's some public evidences, some personal, I mean, some public principles. There's some personal principles now, some public principles that we've got to deal with when we walk in revival. Verse 19, look at this, quench not the spirit. So the next principle, and this is more public, now this is dealing more with the church, there needs to be a heart of obedience. So when he talks about quenching the spirit, what's the difference in quenching the spirit and grieving the spirit? You grieve the spirit when you do the things the Lord does not want you to do. You quench the spirit when you do not do the things the Lord wants you to do. Have you ever noticed every single solitary preacher that preaches has a story about being on the airplane and witnessing? Have you ever noticed that? And I have mine, but you may be honest, I sure wouldn't want to tell you the times that I've been on airplanes and want to pretend that I'm asleep so no one bothers me. Have you ever been there? Did you hear about the man got on the plane one time and he said, Lord, I pray you'd use me to witness to someone. I pray you'd bring someone my way now that's going to hell and they need to be saved. And I pray when you bring them my way, you'd give me a sign. All of a sudden, a big man came and sat right next to him. The plane took off and he started crying. He said, oh my goodness, I'm going to hell. I wish someone on this plane would tell me how to get saved. The man bowed his head and said, Lord, is this a sign? <laughs> 
don't quench the spirit. I'd love to tell all of the stories of the times I've been going down the road and God said, pull in here and talk to this person, and I've done it. But I'd be too embarrassed to tell you of all of the times the Lord said, pull in there and talk to that person, and I kept going. I'd love to tell you about the times the Lord said, go to that altar and pray or go to this person and pray. But I surely wouldn't want to tell you about the times the Lord said to do it, and I just ignored him, and I kept doing my thing because I was busy or I was in a rush. And the Lord says one of the public evidences of revival is there'll be obedience. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, do what he tells you to do. Someone said years ago, we only have an instant to be instantly obedient. When God speaks, do what he says. Have you ever studied revivals? For You know, you go back and study the Hebrides revival. And, and do you know it was so simple? They had a four-part message, confess sin, do away with any bad habits. And then one of the principles that was preached during that revival where God swept and moved was this, obey the Holy Spirit at once. And I'm telling you for all of us, that's a message that's still true to this day. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Amen? When God puts something on your heart, do it. Hey, listen, y'all all, 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 all okay? Well, preacher, I have this urge to go to my neighbor and pray for them. Do you think that's the Holy Spirit? Uh, it's not the devil. Preacher, I have this urge to call my grandson and to tell them the gospel and they need to be saved. Is that the Holy Spirit? It's not the devil. Preacher, I have this urge to write a large check and give it to the church. Do you think, y'all aren't amen in that. Do you think that's the Holy Spirit? It's not the devil. My flesh never once told me to give anything. Amen? All my flesh ever did was say, keep, keep, keep. So do not quench the Holy Spirit when the Lord tells you to do something. Don't argue with him. Just do what he says. Do exactly what he says. Whew. Wow. I don't know why I want to tell this, but, but it does. My mentor, um, the man that poured so much into me, he's been in heaven for years now. Luke was born on his 80th birthday, and so he's been gone, I don't know, 12, 13 years. And I'll never forget when Luke was born. He had seven kids, and I mean to tell you, he ran a tight ship. His name was Reggie, and I said, Brother Reggie, he was in our home. He would come stay in our home sometimes two weeks before we had children. And we'd just pray. We'd talk to the Lord, and he would teach me how to pray and read the Bible, study the Bible. And aren't you thankful for people like that that pour into your life? And both of my grandfathers were deceased before I was born, so he was my adopted grandfather, and he just poured into me. And I remember Luke was a little baby, and I said, Brother Reggie, could you, could you teach me, you know, how can I be a good dad? He said, do you really want me to tell you? I said, sure. And we had a little poodle. We had one at that time. We have another one at that time. We just had poodles everywhere. Poodles. You want one, we'll give you one. But anyway, <laughs> we had this little poodle running around. And he said, Jerry, this is what he said. <laughs> he said, Jerry, I've observed that that little dog listens to everything you say. If you tell him yes, if you tell him no, if you tell him go to bed, if you tell him stay, he listens. And then he pointed to Luke, little bitty baby, and here's what he said. Are y'all ready? He said, until you teach Luke the difference in yes and no, you've not succeeded as a dad. Thank y'all for coming out tonight. <laughs> Thank y'all for coming out. Thank you for coming out. And then he said, you'll never be able to discipline your children until you're disciplined. And so when the Lord tells you something, your answer needs to be yes. And when he tells you not to do something, your answer needs to be yes, sir. Because until you come under the authority of the Lord and model in front of your family someone who is sensitive to the Holy Spirit, You'll never be able to get your kids under authority, and you'll never be able to have a holy, healthy, happy home. And he taught me that 20 years ago, and I've never forgotten it. And I'm giving that to you tonight. It'll cost you nothing extra, free advice. Amen?
All right, let's move on. Y'all, did y'all like that okay? Some of you look like you want to throw something at me. Are we all right? I need to pull that out on a Sunday morning. Amen? So one of the public evidence is there's obedience. Next thing, there's a love for the Word. Now, what do you, notice what he says. Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying. In other words, don't despise the Word. I've got to ask us a question quickly. We're going to finish up. Hurry. We're going to hurry and finish. Are we hungry for the Word? Do we really desire the Word? Listen, church, I say this to honor the Lord. I say this to give the Lord all of the credit. I say this to praise the Lord, not to brag. Not to brag on you, not to brag on us, to brag on Him. One of the distinctives of this church is the spirit of the people in this church wants the Word of God. They want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If I brought a liberal in here to preach... Uh, you'd spot them in a second. Amen? Is that true or false? And it's not because, watch this, it's not because the people in this church are pious or better than anyone else. There's just a sincere hunger to want the truth, honor the Lord, and want the Word of God. And I pray it never leaves. I pray it never changes. I pray it never stops. To the glory of God, may we always be a people of the book. Amen? Amen? Not brag about that, not be arrogant about that, but with a sensitive heart, Lord, I want to know your word. And the Bible tells us that one of the signs of the last days is there's going to be a falling away from the truth. I commend you for wanting the truth. I commend you for wanting nothing but the truth. And the Bible says one of the evidences of a church in revival, watch this, there'll be obedience, there'll be a love for the world. Next thing, now this is is where I'm going to lose a few of you, there'll be separation. Verse 22, abstain, that means avoid, all appearance of evil. Abstain all appearance of evil. Abstain all appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Does that make sense? There's some things, and look, you can get legalistic that you know me, I stay away from that. That's not what we're talking about. But there's just some things you and I just need to avoid just simply because we don't want to ruin and tarnish the testimony of the Lord. Amen? And if I've got to fight for my right to defend it. Okay, now look. I don't drink alcohol. I don't touch alcohol. I don't want alcohol. I don't long for alcohol. Uh, When I preach on this, occasionally people in our church sometimes check out. Not everyone, but some. The drinkers do. Um, I don't don't like alcohol. I don't like the taste of alcohol. Uh, I tried beer in the sixth grade. I got sick at my stomach. Thank you, Jesus, that happened. I've never touched it since. It's disgusting. It's nasty. You don't like the taste. You know you don't like the taste. You say it's an acquired taste. You could drink dishwater long enough, and that's an acquired taste. I don't drink alcohol, okay? I don't touch it. I've never been drunk a day in my life. No, Jesus does not love me anymore because of that. I just don't drink, don't like it, don't buy it, don't want anything to do with it. I've never known any good that's come out of it. If you can name me one good thing that comes out of it and not be sassy or silly, let's talk. I can't name you anything. And if you try to talk to me about something good, then the next time I have to go get a man out of a drunken stupor, you're going with me. And the next time you have to go counsel a mama who's suffering because the daddy's drinking the paycheck, you're going to come with me. And I'm just telling you, it's not. The next time you have to go tell a mama that her child uh, was involved in an accident because he was drinking or she was drinking, you're going to go with me. And I'm just telling you, there's nothing good that comes out of it. So I don't drink. I don't touch it. I don't think the Lord loves me anymore because I'm that way. I just don't like it. I want my, I've, I've begged my kids never touch liquor. And so they've never seen me touch it. So I hope and pray they'll stay away from it. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? I don't ever want my kids to say, well, I'm an alcoholic because daddy was an alcoholic. Or I'm a drinker because daddy was a drinker. I want to lead in front of them, leave alone. Are y'all all listening? Say amen. amen. Now, if I was a drinker, if y'all went out in public, You'll see me in restaurants. Now, I'm not going to back away from a ribeye. And, and, and in fact, I'll eat yours. Amen? But if we're out eating a steak and you see me drinking liquor, I promise you it's going to affect the way you look at me. I promise you that it is. All right? 
So don't sit in here and say, well, now the preacher and, and, and you live by a different set of rules. Just leave it alone. If I get to heaven, here's where I was going with this. And the Lord says, Jerry, you could have had all the alcohol you want. I'm not going to feel like I missed a thing. I'm okay. My Dr. Pepper Zero suffices me just fine. Especially after I heard the lady two weeks ago say she's 103 because she drinks three Dr. Peppers a day. Amen? <laughs> An officer will never pull me over and say, get out of the car. Get out of the car. I smell Dr. Pepper on you. Get out of the car. <laughs> he will never pull me over and say, okay, driving while fat. Who knows what I'm talking about? He'll never. He'll <laughs> okay. Whew. All right. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Can I get an amen from anyone in the room? There's just some things. Okay, now, now watch this. Let, let's talk about a couple of things. Preacher, would you ever walk into a bar to witness to someone? I'm going to blow your mind. If you quote me, you better quote me correctly. So wake up, listen. Preacher, would you ever walk into a bar to witness? You better believe I would, but I'd take some witnesses with me. That's why Jesus sent people out two by two. Amen? So if, I, if God tells me to go to the bar to witness, Charlie, Paul, Bischoff, y'all are going with me. And that way I've got some witnesses. Can I get an amen from I don't know why I singled those two men out, but those are too good to start with. You're going with me. Amen? amen? Abstain from all appearance of evil. And there may be some things that are not inherently evil or wicked or ungodly, but man, if it hurts your testimony. Let me tell you what Paul said. I will do nothing that will cause someone else to stumble. Everything I do, I want to do to the glory of the Lord. Everything I do, I want to do it in Jesus' name. You know, what would Jesus do? Find out what he would do and go do it. But we live in a generation where people are like, but this is my rights and these are my liberties and this is what I can do and I'm free. And you may get to heaven and find out maybe so, that, that maybe you could have done uh, some of the, you know, some of you can't go to a football game. You just can't handle it. You just can't. You lose your testimony. You act like a fool. You throw stuff. You cuss. You get mad. You need to stay home. Don't go to a ball game. And there's nothing wrong with the ball game. It's just wrong for you because you can't control yourself. Amen? Abstain from all appearance of evil. Personal signs of revival. Public signs of revival. Rejoice. Pray. Give thanks. Don't quench the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Put things to the test. Okay, yes. But when you find something that's true, when you find the real deal, cling to it. Amen? A couple of days will be five years I've been pastor at MIMS. It's hard to believe. Time flies. And, uh, you know, I sometimes regret having to wait to 45 to get here. Now I'm 50. And, um, you know, preacher, what took you so long? I got here as fast as I could. Amen? And I've pastored several other churches, but it just took me a while to get where I was going. And, and I'm just telling you folks, listen, when you get a hold of something that's real and something that's true, cling to it. Stay with it. Amen? Stay with it. So who wants revival? And who wants the evidences of revival in their heart? Ask the Lord to let this be so in your life for his honor. Would you pray with me tonight? Father, we're so thankful for your word and we're so thankful for your Holy Spirit and we're so thankful for your goodness to us. Thank you for the privilege of being in your house tonight. Now let us just take a moment, Father, and respond to you and to say yes to you as you speak in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you quietly stand to your feet? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're not going to take long, but while we just all bow our heads and pray, the invitation tonight is for you and for me individually, just between us and the Lord, to respond to what we've heard. And so right where you are, you just talk to the Lord. Whatever it is he's putting on your heart, whatever it is that he's telling you tonight, rejoice evermore. Is there joy in your heart? Is there real, real joy in your heart tonight? I'm not accusing, I'm asking. Just ask the Lord to show you. Pray without ceasing. Are you a person of prayer? God forbid, but if there were a tragedy in your home, in your life, in your family tonight, are you prayed up? Are you a thankful person? In everything, give thanks. And maybe tonight as we go through this, just let the Lord do spiritual inventory in your heart and 
Just say, Lord, help me. Quench not the spirit. Is there a, a holy desire in your heart to obey the Lord and to do as he instructs and as he leads? Despise not prophesying. Is there a desire and a hunger for the word, for the truth? None of these questions are being asked to accuse. These are just questions for us to consider. Abstain from the appearance of evil. Abstain from the appearance of evil. The Bible calls us to be blameless. That's an interesting word when you study it, the word blameless. It doesn't mean perfection. It just means don't give anyone anything to pin your shoulders to the mat. That's what the word literally means. It was a word that was used in, in wrestling in uh, Bible days. Paul would say we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And it was a word that means don't give anyone anything to pin your shoulders to the mat. Live a life above reproach. And so for just a moment or two, as we just talk to the Lord from our heart and we pray, just deal with whatever it is he puts on your heart tonight. And thank him for his grace and his faithfulness. Heavenly Father, it is a joy to come together into the house of God tonight. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of this church. Thank you for being so good to us and so kind to us. And we don't ever, ever want to stop thanking you and praising you and honoring you for your goodness. It's not because we deserve anything. It's all because of who you are. And so, Heavenly Father, tonight, just thank you. Thank you for loving us, for being so kind to us. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. I pray you'll meet every need in this room, every need in the hearts of people and in homes and in families. We give you glory and we give you praise. May we be a people of real joy, a prayerful people, a thankful people, a people that hunger for the word, that listens to you, that obeys the spirit. Help us to worship in spirit and in truth. Help us to walk and live balanced lives. Jesus, we bless you. We praise you. We thank you for your faithfulness. Continue to have your way in Christ's name. And everyone says amen.